Postscript Media, podcast for a changing planet. Everyone has been bugging us to do a show about regenerative agriculture and soil health. I mean, we talk about it all the time. We always say we're going to do a show about it, but it's just such a big topic and there's so much money flowing into it and everybody's into it. The United Nations and corporate America and you know every politician from ag country, you hear so much about regenerative ag. Well, we're finally going to do a show about regenerative ag and We weren't sure how to get into it, so we decided it's like if we were going to do a show about SUVs, we're doing the Hummer. If we were going to do a show about forests, we're doing the Amazon. We decided to start with, like, extreme regenerative ag. Uh, Extreme. This is like if this is the X Games of regenerative ag, and we are doing Kernza. Now, when it comes to, like, ag nerds, Kernza separates, I was going to say the men from the boys, but the wheat from the chaff would be a better (laughs) Get it? (laughs) And uh, if you are an ag nerd, you know what Kernza is. But if you're just an ordinary mortal, you probably don't. So here's what Kernza is. Kernza is a grain that is a perennial. Now, almost all the grains we eat, uh, uh, corn, wheat, oats, sorghum, they're all annuals. And that contributes to the climate footprint because they have to be uh, harvested and cut down in the fall and regrow new uh, in spring. And anyone who has a garden is familiar with the difference between annuals and perennials. And Kernza is a relative of wheat. It's not actually wheat. It's something called intermediate wheatgrass. Um, And It tastes a lot like wheat, and more on that later, and it has a lot of advantages that annuals do not have. So Kernza was the brainchild of the Land Institute, which was founded by a guy named Wes Jackson. He's one of the godfathers of regenerative ag, and this whole idea that Regenerative essentially refers to the soil. The idea is that instead of extractive agriculture, we should try to have regenerative agriculture that builds up the soil, that maybe puts carbon in the soil, that restores the microbiome of the soil, all those good microbes and earthworms and all the cool stuff that gives soil its kind of healthy awesomeness that people love to talk about and you hear all the time about how there's, you know, there's more life in a tablespoon of soil than there is in, you know, all the rainforests, you know, in terms of mammals. There's a lot of stuff going on in soil. And certainly the idea of regenerative agriculture is to try to promote that. And perennials, particularly when they have the kind of big roots, they're around all the time. The idea is that this is really, really good for the soil. And Kernza has kind of become the the poster crop for regenerative agriculture. Uh, the people at Patagonia have sort of latched onto it, and and they're making some products with it. And it for good reasons. It does all of the things that you were just talking about. It has these big root systems that reach in deep, that sequester carbon deep in the soil, that enable these microbial communities that contribute to soil health. You don't have to plow. It's great for erosion control. There's lots to love about Kernza. Yeah, and look, we'll... uh you know, not to give any spoilers, but the good folks at the Land Institute, they did send us some of their products to try. And Kernza is still, it's only on 6,000 acres where we have, what, 400 million acres of, uh, of farmland and uh, of, of cropland in the United States. So it's still very tiny, but they gave us some crackers and pasta and flour and beer. And because my partner on this show, Tamar, is a phenomenal chef, uh, she cooks some of this stuff up for us. And we were able to see that they they make a lot of big claims about how this is uh, this is you know beer that's drawing down carbon it's climate smart pasta so we're gonna get into it because there are a lot of really cool things about Kernza but there is one big problem 
I hope I didn't cook it wrong. No, no, you're an amazing chef um, among all the other bazillion things you do well. And, uh, oh, how nice. and it was really quite delicious, not to give away the end of our show. Um, but yeah, Kernza does have this, you know, I don't want to say fatal flaw, but certainly currently fatal flaw. And you know, people talk around it. The Washington Post did this like massive, massive magazine story about about Kernza that I think it was like 7,000 words. And you had to get to like the 38th paragraph before they even mentioned this one huge problem. It's a problem that listeners to this show will be familiar with. It's, uh, it's kind of one of those, you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, did you enjoy the play? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pretty big problem, and uh, I think we're going to get into it. So other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, I'm Michael Grunwald. And I'm, Miss, uh, I'm Tamar Haspel, and this is Climavores, a show about eating on a changing planet. So pretty much as long as we've had industrial agriculture, we've had people complaining about industrial agriculture. And for good reasons that we talk about a lot on the show, um, the huge chemical use, right? The, uh, the pollution, uh, the fertilizers, the effect on the soil. Um, there really is all kinds of substantive agronomic problems, as well as the kind of larger political and cultural problems that we talk about as well in terms of, you know, their, you know, the subsidies, the, you know, lobbying against climate action, the mistreatment of farm workers. People really don't like industrial agriculture. And uh, Wes Jackson, who is the author of New Roots for Agriculture, was one of the real pioneers in saying, hey, uh, we need to come up with a better way. And to wildly oversimplify his work, you know, Wes was from Kansas and he looked at what had happened to Kansas and essentially said, you know, this used to be a prairie and it was really nice. And now it's a wheat field and there are problems. Um, and that's when he started thinking about how can we come up with a way to regenerate rather than erode the soil. And he had this idea of perennial agriculture that either you could domesticate wild perennials or perennialize domesticated annuals. Um, there were sort of the two choices of how you could do it. And he recognized it was going to be really hard when he wrote, in, uh, he wrote his book in 1981. And he said, given a little bit of money and 100 years, we can do it. And how many years ago was that? <laughs> so that was, that was 40 years in. And I guess- <laughs> Okay, we got 60 left. <laughs> to one extent- he did it. There is Kernza, right? So, so Tamar, tell our listeners a little bit about what is Kernza and really what is a perennial and, and why we care about it. So anyone who gardens is intimately familiar with the difference between perennials and annuals and how, you know, the asparagus and the rhubarb come up every year and, uh, and the tomatoes don't, unfortunately. And uh, so, and those amber waves of grain, wheat, is an annual. And when you have to uh, kill off the crop or let it die off and dry in the ground, um, and then prepare the soil for the next crop, a number of things happen. Even if you're doing no-till, you still have to drill and plant and you lose some of the carbon that's that's uh, sequestered in the soil. You disturb the microbial communities there. You encourage erosion and runoff. And I would say that nutrient runoff into uh, uh, bodies of water is probably the number one environmental uh, impact that, that these systems have. And perennials solve a lot of those problems, or at least they go a long way toward solving them. So when I was at the Land Institute, they have this picture of the root system of Kernza versus the root system of annual wheat. And they have to hang it in the stairwell because the root system of Kernza is so big. It's like eight feet tall. Well, I have one here. I did. Do you have a visual aid? Oh, you have that? There it is. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, <gasps> That's awesome. I didn't know that. You know, you see like a normal, a normal wheat plant, which, uh, and I guess this is, uh, this is 
not even, it's just one sixth of the actual size, but the normal wheat plant kind of looks like, you know, it's maybe the size of my arm up to the elbow. And, uh, and then they have the Kernza plant, which is, you know, half my body. <laughs> and they have the full size one at the Land Institute. And it's, it's remarkable. And of course, when you have a robust root system like that, all kinds of good things happen. Um, for starters, uh, in a dry climate, this is particularly important, and as weather patterns change, it becomes more and more important. Long, deep roots have access to deep water that annuals don't have access to. Um, and also, the roots, the microbial communities develop around these roots deep into the soil. And when the plant dies, that root system is going to, to lock most of its carbon, most of its organic matter, in the soil. So it is great for erosion control. It's great for dry climates. It's great for sequestering carbon. And of course, it's good for biodiversity because it's something different from what's out there right now. And, you know, if you've ever been to the prairie, you, you see this like riot of all kinds of different grasses. And that's the model the Land Institute is using. And, and, and perennial grains are part of, are envisioned as being part of a solution that includes all kinds of other plants as well. So you have this biodiverse collection of plants working together, sequestering carbon, supporting beneficial insects, preventing erosion. It, I mean, it, it has a lot going for it. Right, right. So they, they talk about this kind of polyculture of perennials as opposed to the monoculture of annuals, right? And that's the kind of amber waves of grain the, you know, that, that are usually subjected to this constant chemical warfare that, that we're always talking about. So there are sort of two different types of kind of benefits we're talking about. One is, right, right like that there's, like you don't have to run your tractor over and over again all year long and um, and we we talk a lot about uh, you hear about cover crops, right? Because this idea that like oh you want to keep the ground covered all year long so it doesn't kind of blow away, um, and of course perennials solve that problem by you know not dying, <laughs> so so uh, so it's covered all the time. And then one thing that the Land Institute really talks about, and this is it's funny because we use this uh, word in another context um, again to avoid the spoiler alerts, but that these uh, they're very efficient. Um, these these perennial crops, not in the efficiency that we sometimes talk about and will talk about later, but in the in the way they are their sort of relationship to inputs is incredibly efficient in that because they have these roots, they capture so much nitrogen of the nitrogen that's dumped on them. They say as much as like 95%, while uh, an, an ordinary wheat plant might only capture 50%. And that means, you know, less less nitrogen that leaches into the aquifer or runs off into the stream or the river or into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, those are really big problems, as you said. And also for water, particularly as the wheat is often such a dry land crop, you know, they really want to take advantage of every drop of water that falls. And when you have these roots deep into the soil, you use the water better, and again, less runoff so it doesn't wash the soil away and wash all the bad stuff away. And what's happening right now is sort of putting this in stark relief. We're seeing farmers struggle with wheat yields as weather patterns change. And, you know, uh, you mentioned it, it's a dryland crop that's not irrigated. And so uh, when there's no water coming out of the sky, there's no water for the wheat. And so, you know, this is sort of the perennial grains superpower is to be able to survive um, when there's very little water. And, and you know, every day that seems to become more important. And you do hear that generally about the people who are proponents of regenerative agriculture. One thing they talk about and is that it's it's more resilient to nasty conditions, particularly drought. That's mm -hmm. one of the uh, one of the certainly the selling points is that as we get into this warmer world uh, with weirder weather, um, that if you're taking care of the soil, if your if your plants are deep rooted in the soil, they're just going to be better prepared for the nastiest nastiness that's coming along. But that infrastructure does not come for free. 
And this is where we get into one of the problems with perennial grains. So the plant has to devote a lot of energy to building that root system. And the the good people at land have estimated that perennials devote about half of their energy to roots, whereas annuals only devote about a quarter of their energy to roots. And the less you devote to roots, the more you can devote to seeds, which is the part of the plant that we eat. And so perennials, they start like they're handicapped because they're only using half of their energy to build the plant above ground. Now, some of it, they make up a little bit because uh, anyone who's ever like done spring foraging for greens knows that, you know, some perennials are up very early in the spring and perennials start growing long before you can put your annuals in the ground. So they do get a head start. So it's kind of a bigger pie of sunlight, but they have to, they devote a smaller slice of it to seed heads. And so here's the, uh, here's the question. Um, what does that, how does that play out in the plant itself? And the big issue, which of course you know already, is yield. Yeah, it's a problem, man. It's a problem. It's a, you know, we do talk about this incessantly on Climavores, but yield matters. It doesn't just matter to Cargill and Monsanto and, uh, you know, big evil agriculture companies. It matters to the climate um, because lower yield means that it takes more land to make the same amount of food. And right now the world is basically divided evenly between agricultural land and natural land. And that means at this point, we can't keep expanding our agricultural land because that means more deforestation and more emissions. Um, we need to, if anything, shrink our agricultural footprint. And that's going to mean much higher yields, even higher than we already have now. And unfortunately, Kernza, you know, while their yields are improving, a few years ago, they were only one fourth of, ye of wheat yields. They are now up to one third of ye wheat yields. But that's terrible. It means they need three times as much land to make the same amount of food. And that is just, uh, at this rate, that is not sustainable. All right, um, wait a second. I got to tell a story out of school here. So when I was over at Mike's house and I made the dinner with the Kearns of Pastas, and, and Mike has this dog. And his, his name is Wags. And he's really cute. And he's really sweet. And he's like this little Jack Russell rat terrier mix of some kind. And one of his ears flops over. And, you know, and he, he was sucks. hanging around the table. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. He was hanging around the table. And I'm like, oh, he's so sweet. And and and, and he's, he's so nice. And, and Mike says, oh, and he's dumb as a post. And, and I said to Wags, oh, daddy doesn't mean it. <laughs> and Mike's like, yeah, daddy totally means it. And when Mike says things like, Kurt, this is terrible, I always want to say, oh, daddy doesn't mean it. But of course he does mean it. I mean, daddy feels <laughs> and, bad because Kern's a, and the and and to their super credit. Now look, this is something in the regenerative agriculture world. You see a lot of people trying to hand wave away the question of yields, you know, basically saying, like, oh, yields don't matter. Like we can just you know, stop wasting so much food or stop eating so much meat or, you know, deal just we're going to store so much carbon. It isn't going to matter. We're going to save the world that way. And to the, their credit, the folks at the Land Institute are not like that. Um, they care about yield and they know that currently yield is a huge problem and that no farmer is going to want to plant Kernza if the yields stay this low. Right. It's not a viable crop Climatically, it's not a viable, a viable crop financially unless the yields improve. And of course, working on it, the fact that they've gone from, you know, a quarter to a third of the yield of wheat is a very significant uptick. Um, and, and of course, it's really tempting to say, okay, well, given time, we can just get the yields higher and higher. And there's some truth to that. Right. They, they actually, I should say that they say that even by 2035, maybe they, you know, which I think is a little 
optimistic, but you know, conceivably with better breeding, they could match current wheat yields, which aren't good enough. <laughs> but uh, but it, that would be awesome. And you know, there there is, I think, in some of the conversations, and not the ones with the Land Institute. I'm a huge fan of the Land Institute. I think they're wonderful. But in the conversations out in the public about perennial grains, there's there's a little bit of magical thinking because there are some inherent constraints in infra and in, in the infrastructure and in the roots that that. Uh, perennials have to put down, and it makes it harder for them to yield the kinds of of amounts that we need to have a viable grain. But I do think that it can get better. I do think you know the head start that they get in the spring is going to be meaningful. I do think that there is going to be a place for perennial grains, and I think it's also important to note that it's going to vary by plant. I, I think it, this is really key to mention that up front, like even, even in New Roots for Agriculture, um, when West West Jackson was first thinking about this in 1981, um, the introduction was written by Wendell Berry, right? The great environmental writer. And he, he focused right in on this. He said, the main practical difficulty is that a perennial cannot afford to concentrate all its energy into seed, just like Tamar just said. Some energy must be saved to maintain its root system through the winter and start growth again in the spring. Thus, the hardest question is about a possible conflict between herbaceous perennialism and high yield. It can only be answered by success or failure. And to which I will add, the folks at the Land Institute Today, they will say that question has not yet been answered. They might fail. This might never amount to something that farmers will be willing to adopt and that can actually make it a, a real impact on the food system. It's great that they say that they're storing an extra, at least for the first couple decades, they think they store about an extra ton of carbon per hectare. You know, that's about two and a half acres. And that's great, but that's nowhere near enough to make up for the losses of having to cut down two acres of prairie or wetlands or forest for every acre of Kernza that you plant. However, a piece of evidence in favor of the ability to parent for perennials to have high yields is a perennial with high yields. And although Kernza has become, you know, the poster crop for perennial grains, um, there's a better one, and it's perennial rice. And it was developed in China, and it's actually being planted in a lot of places in China, and it's showing yields that are equivalent to, and in some cases a little better, than the annualized version of, of those of those uh, plants. And it's yielding about a little under seven tons per hectare, which is under a little under three tons an acre, which is less than we get in the United States, but equivalent to what they get in lots of parts of the world. And on my uh, very important, super nerdy, ag metric calories per acre, it does very well at 10 million calories per acre. And that compares to uh, about uh, 15 million for corn, which is incredibly productive, and about four to six million for wheat, which is not nearly as productive as corn. So perennial rice is doing very well, but there's a reason for it. Rice has some perennial-ish characteristics, so it'll grow new shoots if you chop it down. And it also has a very close relative that is a bona fide uh, perennial. But the third reason that perennial rice has been a success is that the Chinese threw a lot of money at it. As, you know, for all the reasons Mike just said, for a plant breeder, this is a really hard problem, turning an annual into a perennial. Um, and it takes a lot of iterations. There's still a lot of trial and error in plant breeding, even with the precision tools that they have now. And a lot of places are unwilling to go with genetic modification because people are really uh, unnerved by that. And and if if this is going to work, it has to be a success in the in the marketplace. But the, and that perennial rice, Mike, it gives me optimism. 
Well, and I think one lesson of that, as you said, sort of per, you know, rice is more perennialish than wheat um, to begin with, right? It is. It really does matter how you know how we grow what we eat, but often what we eat matters even more. And this might be ultimately more of an argument for we need to you know the world needs to shift towards perennialish types of crops like like rice and away from you know you know, inherently annual-ish types of crops like wheat, um, when you see how hard it is to try to make wheat behave like a prairie, right? Uh, it, right. And, and still provide the kind of yields that you want from a wheat field. That is, that is really difficult. Um, I will point out that, uh, and this is, <laughs> this is sometimes Tamar's, more Tamar's theme than mine, is that, you know, while yield, we both 100% agree, is massively important. And when it comes to the climate impact of food, yield is the most important thing. But yield isn't everything. And, uh, and they talk about <gasps> Who that. Who are you and what have you done with Mike? <laughs> yeah. Well, they talk about that a lot at the, at, the, at, at the Land Institute. And in fact, their Twitter handle is Nature as Measure. And their idea is like yield, very easy to measure. <laughs> like we uh, we know how to compare Kernza to wheat, and right now it's not nearly as good, and it's got to get way better. Um, but there's also nature is an important value too, um, not just in the like we like things that are natural, but in the you know, soil carbon, in the biodiversity, in things that we really care about, and in the, the health of the soil, which can someday contribute to yields. And so they're very keen on this idea that you want to measure more than just the output. You want to measure, you know, essentially not just how much is it like a wheat field, but how much is it like a prairie? And that's important too. Um, what we've seen and you know, my, my classic example is when I went to Tom Steyer's Regenerative Ranch um, in California, which does an excellent job of being more like, you know, a natural, natural land than a normal pasture. Um, so there is much more biodiversity than it is on, you know, they have different kinds of grass. But it is not a biodiverse landscape. Like a pure, like if they just let it go to nature and took the cows off, it would be way more biodiverse. And the the yield on that place is just absurd. And it turned out it wasn't even storing more carbon. So again, these are all to again quote Tamar. You know, they are all trade offs all the time, but. You really have to make the trade-offs. And here with Kernza, there's a gigantic yield trade-off that is at this point not acceptable by any measure. Um, with some at oh, this daddy point. Oh, daddy doesn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's some, you know, with some modest biodiversity and carbon gains. The the hope is that as they use this, as Tom Steyer is trying to use this as a laboratory to do the research, they're talking about more intercropping so that you'll have the Kernza maybe with some legumes and some soybeans or who knows, um, that'll have more biodiversity as well as, you know, maybe higher yields and also more, pe you need less pesticides. And that's, that's right. And when I was there, um, the Land Institute is next to a field that by all the records they can dig up indicates that it's original prairie. It's never been plowed. It's never been touched. And I stood there looking at it with the then president of the Land Institute, uh, Fred Eutzi. And Fred, if I'm botching your name, I'm really sorry. And we're looking at this big riot of different kinds of plants. There's tall ones and short ones. There's yellow ones. There's green ones. There's flowering ones. There's non-flowering ones. There's all these insects buzzing around. They're all coexisting. And the soil is rich, and it's sequestering all of this carbon. And Fred points at it and says, you know, this is the system we're trying to mimic, but not because it's natural, because it works. And so they're trying to learn what it is about these systems that we can harness in an agricultural system. And so a system with Kernza isn't 
you know, big fields of Kernza for a couple of reasons. Because, you know, perennials, for all of their advantages, have some problems too. And one of them is pests. So if you have a perennial field that just sits there year after year, the pests are going to become a huge problem because they're like, hey, nobody's taking this away in, in the fall. We can just hang out. And so the vision is what, what, Mike, what you were just talking about. So intercropped with legumes. It's not going to be there eternally just because it's perennial doesn't mean that yields don't fall off and you have to replant it at some at some point. And, you know, the one perennial crop that is in common rotation here is alfalfa, and it, it's not there for good and all. It's there. Farmers put it there for a few years and then they take it out as it starts to yield less and less. And so, you know, this isn't a solution. It's a piece of a solution. And you know, one of the, actually one of the best things I learned when I was out there was that um, you can put two different crops in a field, and you can even you can uh, uh, alternate rows and do everything like that because modern combines, which is which are just amazing machines, can be programmed to plant and harvest in that way. And I didn't know that when I went to Kansas and all you farmers out there are kind of rolling your eyes and laughing at me that I didn't know that. But I am like the president of the combine fan club because not just because it 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 means that people don't have to do the backbreaking labor of planting and harvesting themselves. I and understand I've, it combines some of those, uh, some of those. Yes, yes. Hence the name. <laughs> but it can also do really amazing things. And, you know, this is another thing in the ag space that I think sometimes this gets short shrift because, you know, expensive combines, and, you know, they, they can be seven figures. Expensive combines are only uh, an option for really big farms. And really big farms have been taking it on the chin from the good food people. But the thing about farms is that they scale. And when you have a really big farm, you can afford to farm it with machinery, with much less labor. And that is one of the ways that food stays cheap. And, you know, we were talking about yield and talking about farming. And one of the things that's been incredibly frustrating to me is that the our industrialized food system has sort of been you know, it's all been lumped together and it's been labeled bad. And so efficiency and machinery sometimes go in the same bucket as, you know, nutrient runoff and monocropping. And, you know, the machines and the efficiency are the good part of industrial agriculture. And, and like every day out on Twitter, I'm out there trying to decouple what's good about our industrial system from what's bad about our industrial system. Because, we, you know, the answer to a bad industrial system isn't a non-industrial system. It's a better industrial system. <laughs> You're hard, hard at toiling in the Twitter fields. We, uh, we appreciate your back you and me breaking, both. <laughs> breaking labor. I look, I do <gasps> think this is, these are like really good points and it, but scale really does matter. Right. And, and right now, in fact, even like Kernza, when we're talking about this as a viable crop, we're talking decades in the future. And this problem, you know, of feeding the world without frying the world is a right now problem, right? We are heading fast towards 9 billion people on earth. Um, we are going to need another quadrillion calories every year soon. Um, and we've got to reduce deforestation. So there really does, you know, we talk about the, you know, moving past monocultures to these kind of nicer, sort of more garden-like, more prairie-like diverse fields. Um, that's going to be tough because there there is a trade-off and it's not a coincidence that even after 40 years the uh the kernza that we ate tomorrow and I think we're going to talk about that next yes it was grown in a monoculture it was grown with modern fertilizer and just as much as uh, as a wheat field so 
again, there's a, there's this vision of the future and it's a regenerative future and it's exciting and it probably does depend on, you know, reducing food waste and reducing, you know, ruminant meat consumption and uh, a lot of other changes in the way we farm so that, you know, some of these yield penalties are not as penalizing. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also this really desperate emergency that we're looking at um, that's going to require a lot of food and a lot less land in a real hurry. So here's the thing. If you buy some of those products, and some of them are for sale, Patagonia uh, sells uh, at least the beer, and I think a, another uh, Kearns of product as well, there are Kearns of products on the market. And if you buy them, you are doing your part for climate, but not because Kernza is doing its part for climate yet. You're doing your part for climate because you're, you're putting money in the pot for people to continue to do the breeding work that will someday, we hope, make Kernza part of the solution. But the key question, what does it taste like? And the answer is good. I've tasted a bunch of kerns of uh, products, in, including uh, a couple of years ago, a, a kind of a porridge where you really can taste it. And the beer, which, I mean, tastes like beer. Uh, but we had two kinds of pasta and we had crackers and uh, we had kerns of flour and I made a banana bread with half kerns of half uh, just plain white flour. And we had a panel of tasters, including my husband and uh, Mike's son, Max, and then Mike's daughter, uh, Lena, and Mike's wife, Christina, ventured in. And it was funny because we had the crackers out and they, they, we were encouraging everybody to try them. And both Lena and Christina did exactly the same thing. They picked up a cracker and they took the tiniest little nibble off of the end of it, chewed and thought for a second and said, hey, this is delicious, and then ate the rest of it. Right. And, and basically, I mean, you know, I don't want to sort of overly mystify this, right? I mean, this was delicious. Because, well, the crackers are delicious because they're like crackers, right? There, and it's, uh, and I think wheat flour. They had more wheat flour than uh, than uh, than kerns of flour. Um, and the pasta was delicious because it was like wheat pasta, and it uh, it and Tamar made a delicious sauce with uh, some sausage in it, and uh, and it was. Awesome, um, but again, I think what the even the pasta. I think one of them was twenty. The egg noodles or knockoff were like twenty percent kernza, mm -hmm. and the uh, and the more normal kind of shell type pasta was like thirty percent kernza. Um, and our, the crackers had a ton of butter in them, yeah. which of course makes yeah. everything so taste better. So did the better. banana bread, which which even because because Tamar did not have the courage of her kernza convictions, was only fifty percent uh, uh, kerns of flour. Um, and again, so you know the if you look at they do actually call them climate smart noodles. Um, there, the beer calls it like drink draw down by drinking up, um, and uh, that's that's still kind of bogus. I mean, I think as we've said, like as long as the yields are this lousy, you're actually not helping the climate by uh, by eating this stuff. But it's exciting. And as we say, when we talk about alternative proteins, the fake meats, all that kind of stuff, like taste is going to be non-negotiable. And so the fact that this stuff at least, you know, clearly does not ruin the taste of a cracker or, you know, a flour, and that's that's exciting. That means that that means that they can, you know, proceed. You're still not there yet because your yields are still ridiculous, um, but there is uh, you know, we can see you've at least got one part of the of the solution here, right? I I'm sure that the Land Institute is on the edge of their seat just waiting for the climavore stamp of approval <laughs> and they'll breathe a sigh of relief knowing that they've got it. Climavores is a production of Postscript Media and we want to know what you're thinking. We want another mailbag episode so please give us a call 508-377-3449 or drop us an email at climavores at postscriptaudio.com. 
The show is hosted by me, Tamar Haspel. And me, Michael Grunwald. Scott Clavenna and Stephen Lacey are the executive producers. And senior editor is Ann Bailey. Producers are Dalvin Abawaje and Daniel Waldorf. Mixing is by Sean Marquin and Roy Campanella. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, a venture capital firm focused on climate solutions across energy, food, agriculture, transportation, logistics, and advanced materials. Thank you so much for listening to us, and we would love it if you said nice things about us. You can spread the word by giving us a rating, a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're also streaming on Amazon Music. And please tell your friends, send them a link, tell them to listen. And we'll see you right back here next week. 